Okay. Thanks for watching. Now this is a uh, Holbein acrylic wash, which is just an acrylic paint that dries to a matte finish. And I do this one first because, you know, it, it kind of goes on top of everything. You know, I want, I want the lighting effect to kind of float above her, in front of her. Once I'm done with that, I'll let that dry and then I'll start inking. Once again, that's this stuff, uh, light magenta. Just an acrylic polymer. So I'll let that dry and then I'll get out my, you guys can see my, uh, These are all in the you know, materials and tools I'll be using. You know, nothing, nothing new, but I just thought I'd start keeping those little placards to the side so that you can always tell what I'm using. The only thing that I don't have written down is the, the kind of paper that I'm working on. Actually, you know what? I think I can show that. Uh, this is the stuff, Pacific Inkjet. I just started using it um, well, maybe a month ago and really liked it. It's thin enough to go through my printer, but it's thick enough to hold up to watercolor. You know, you can't do like a big gradient or a big background wash, but enough, you know, for this kind of stuff. And with, with watercolor, as long as it's not sopping wet, that's fine. Although, you know, the, the funny thing is if you, if you do make it, if you go all in and you make it sopping wet, then it, ironically it uh, starts to work again. Because the, the problem with, with water is that it, it makes the, the paper buckle because it, it gets wet unevenly. And so one solution is to work in sort of a dry manner and the other solution is just to wet everything down and so you'll see that if you if you look at any like professional gouache tutorials on youtube uh, especially some of the like the um the background painters for anime those guys like they really know what they're doing and so they'll put down the paper they won't even tape it down or anything and they'll just soak it Make it completely wet and then work wet into wet. And that's best for, uh, you know, again,
backgrounds, anything with like a, a nice big blue sky, that kind of stuff. So I'm, I've, I've never really worked that way. I'm, I'm always slightly curious, but never brave enough to try it. I keep meaning to check out, uh, I think his name is Justin Donaldson. He does a lot of tutorials about that. You know, he's, I don't think he's like actually a, a background painter but he uses a lot of the same techniques. You know, he's obviously done extensive study to master that, that approach. Oh, and you know what, I meant to, uh, if you'll excuse me for one second, I meant to post this uh, YouTube address on Twitter. Right, and I'm back. I just, you know, like to make sure that if you want to watch, well, it's available. I was sure to, when I listed this, this type of pen, I always make sure that people know I'm, I'm just using the regular cartridge ink refills. Because for some reason people, uh, I don't know, they'll try this, this pen out and they don't, they don't like it. So I don't, I don't always know what the deal is. Uh, but this this ink is waterproof, so as soon as it's down and it dries, then you can paint over it with watercolor. Or you can use a marker as well. Let's see if, if that is clear enough. I feel like it could be clearer. Maybe I'll I'll go in for a little bit. I'll zoom in. You guys can get a, a finer picture. And if you're curious about the materials, you can go back and look earlier in the video. I mean, the, the detail in some of these is it's pretty tight. Good. Good. 
I never figure out how I, I like to do eyes. Meaning I, I don't have like a, a set way of doing it. But a lot of times like light colored eyes just sometimes just random random dots kind of have the best look. I'm talking about the you know the iris and the pupil. Because often you know what what you end up seeing is just it's a collection of pretty much random reflections. So if you want that sparkly look like you, you can just kind of do anything you know within the bounds of whatever the a fairly solid drawing will give you. You can see, you know, the tip of this uh, the brush. It's really at the very, very tip. It's only a couple hairs. You know, I mean, they're nylon thread, but so when I first when I first touch the paper, it uh, I mean, it's barely touching it. What was that question? Uh, ink washes. I mean, I do ink washes sometimes, but never with this brush. If I do an ink wash, it's going to be with uh, a regular brush. And um, but the thing is, is if I'm going to do that, then I might as well just use uh, watercolor because I just this is the way I like to work, basically. Also with uh, with ink. It, it, I feel like it doesn't have as much give as watercolor. Like watercolor, you've got a little bit more working time. And with uh, ink, I feel like it sets a little bit faster, which can be a good thing, but it just kind of depends. Uh, opaque acrylic. Yeah, it's just a weird thing. The, the gouache has more to do with the finish. Um, that's that's why it's called that. Uh, but yeah, it's just it's just acrylic paint. But uh, if you if you go out and you buy you know what's termed uh, acrylic paint, it's usually gonna have a somewhat glossy finish, which I actually don't really like, and I I, I really I don't like the feel of it at all. Um, it just feels too plasticky. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a few different reasons for, for, for at least for why I like to use acrylic gouache. And it, it pretty much all has to do with the, the matte surface. So, it is opaque and that it's nice, but a lot of times I'm actually, back when I used to paint, actually paint with it, and by paint, I mean uh, like render things, not not like this, this is kind of like line work. Uh, I would actually use it quite thinly, so really the reason I, I liked it was it had nothing to do with the opacity at all. Um, for one thing, uh, one, of, one of the nice things about it is when you're finished, it is easy to scan. And for someone who started out his career at, uh, you know, I was working in oil paint back in like up until 2006. And I, I definitely don't recommend that for comics. So hopefully I can save some young souls out there. But um, once I switched to acrylic wash, it was just much, much easier to get my final works into the computer. Just using a regular old scanner. 
prior to that, you know, I've, I tried everything, oil paints, I, I would sometimes scan. And the thing is, sometimes it, it actually worked pretty well. Sometimes I'd scan an oil painting and like, to my surprise, it was fairly easy. And then other times it took me, you know, hours and hours just to get it to look somewhat close to what the finished painting looked like. Yeah, those, those were pretty trying times for me. Um, you know, making comics, drawing is hard enough as it is, and then I made it harder for myself by not listening to people and um, just thinking that I could paint in oils. Um, and so one of the other benefits of using acrylic wash is you know, because it's a matte surface, it, uh, the surface feels like clay. So, you know, I was saying earlier, like, I don't like the plastic feel of it. Um, well, the alternative is it, it feels like clay and clay is very, very absorbent for water. And so subsequent layers of paint are, you know, much more, they, they just go on easier. It's easier to paint over. It's easier to do layering. And that could be either a wash or an, an opaque, uh, an opaque layer. You know, it really doesn't matter either one. It, it's it's better, at least in my opinion. Um, and you can still get that. Um, you know, the, the the main benefit of acrylics and oils is that you can varnish it at the end and really, you know, get those deep, deep darks. Uh, which looks great in person. Um, it's a it's a mess, an absolute mess to photograph or scan, but it does really look great for originals. But the thing is, you could also do that with acrylic wash. So if you just paint your painting and then get to the very end and varnish it, you can make it shiny if you want. Um, but it's up to you. And furthermore, um, it's a somewhat unifying factor. So when you're using different pigments, uh, with acrylics, some are very shiny and others are not as shiny, just the same way that some are transparent and others are opaque. It just depends on the pigment because you're, you're dealing with a, a physical, you know, physical matter, and they're just going to react differently. Um, but with acrylic wash, you can kind of, everything is formulated to <laughs> basically result in the exact same finish. And so it's, as a result, it's much more predictable. And you can still go for that shiny surface at the end if you want. I've never done that, but I've, I've kind of wanted to just, just to try it out. Um, I eventually did go back to, well, I, I went to acrylic wash first in 2006, 2007, and then I went full gouache in 2008. And that was just primarily for working, workability. You know, and I would still use it in some aspects. Um, like if, if I was absolutely sure about something or something was uh, a graphic element, then acrylic wash is the way to go. But if I were rendering something and I, I wanted more of a, a watercolor handling, then I would use um, regular gouache. Sorry, that. That may be more information that you bargained for, but I know it is. It's it can be very confusing. It was confusing when I first started. I didn't really understand why, just why all the distinctions. But there there is reasoning and thinking behind it. And this is basically my my take on it. I'll take a, another look at the the comments in a second. I'm trying to concentrate on finishing up this part. That's pretty good. Anything else? No, I think that's good. I might clean up some of the eyes with my uh, Copic. Actually, you know what? <laughs> I don't have my Copic because it, it fell in the car. So this is a Stadler pigment liner, 0.1 millimeter. Uh, this is just good for touch-ups on eyes and those kinds of things. It is, it is tough for me to keep, 
keep control with the, the brush sometimes for really tiny stuff and for um, anything where I have to switch directions. You know, brushes are generally good for the long flowing arcs. Yeah, but not much, you know. It's really, most people wouldn't, wouldn't notice it. All right, uh, next up will be um, watercolor. But let me take a look at the chat. Yeah, the, the map finish. It is. It's it's super confusing. All all the terminology, you know. I, I first came across uh, across gouache because of Alex Ross, and uh, you know that I would read in Wizard magazine like how how he worked, and I had never heard of gouache before. Uh, you know, despite you know, I grew up in my parents' art supply store, so I was pretty pretty lucky kid as far as just having almost unlimited access to really nice art materials and um, but I still hadn't heard of gouache before I, I had tried watercolor and um, I'd always liked it I know some people don't don't care for it but for me it just it always made a certain amount of intuitive sense but um, you know, he, he described it as just opaque watercolor, and that's basically what it is. Um, the only thing, other thing I'd say is that whenever he's interviewed, he's, he usually says gouache, and, but he also says watercolor. And, and the truth is, I think he uses both. And uh, I didn't realize that until maybe five years ago. Because um, I, I, I somewhat still paint like him in, in just in the, the overall process. Oh, the uh, comic art live pieces. I'll I'll show them uh, maybe at the at the end. They are all they're almost done. Uh, so what I think Alex Ross is doing is, you know, I, I mentioned this before. He he does the underpainting in gouache, and then I think he colors in watercolor. And so I've actually started doing that as well. Um, but it, it, you know, it makes a difference because you know the gouache is opaque, and so I was trying to do transparent color over the gouache, and I realized like watercolor would work a lot better. Now, it, for me, it, it kind of depends on the painting. Sometimes there's a particular effect I want, and other times it's it's different. So it really it really does depend. All right, now I'm going to switch to my brush. And, uh-oh, where is my watercolor? You know what? It's upstairs. If you guys can wait just one second, I'll be right back. It's in my back. Got that, and I think I've got. There it is. So I kind of have like a, a mobile working studio for when I take the kids to their their classes. But sometimes I forget. I try to have two of everything, but the one thing I don't have two of everything is. These watercolors, I just take the palette with me. But uh, since we're doing that, I can show this. This is what I'm working on. These are for Comic Art Live. This one, uh, I was going to do ink and color, and I just, I was putting so much work into it, I even took reference, um, that I just decided to go all in and do fully painted. 
So I'd say it's about halfway done right now. I'm still kind of blocking everything out and just getting the overall feel for like the light. And then once I'm happy with that, then I'll go in and do, you know, detail and just kind of smooth everything out. But uh, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so this is my palette. It is mostly Holbein watercolor, but I, as always, I have my uh, Payne's Gray from M. Graham. And uh, why don't we start with that? It's the uh, silver brush black velvet. You can see how nicely that just, man, painting on this paper is great. Um, it's a little too absorbent for my taste, but for, for these kind of, uh, for this kind of remark, it's perfect. I think it, I think it would be much tougher if it were fully painted, but for line work, it's great. that out. I think I'll kind of pink, maybe some permanent red, a touch of alizarin, get it more in the pink spectrum, wash that out, and then I'll go back in and uh, I basically do the same little design, whether it's uh, Jean Grey or Psylocke or Scarlet Witch. <laughs> but we'll, we'll blame the writers. I don't know. <laughs> if, I, if I were actually doing the book, I think I would put a little more effort into creating a more distinctive look for their energy effects. But, you know, for a little remark like this, I, I'm not going to. I'm going to sweat it too much. All right. For, um, for red hair, I, I usually start with burnt sienna, which is uh, very orange, but it's earthy. And then once I kind of do a, a base coat on everything, then I'll go back in and do my uh, if rendering if I, if I want any, so shadows and highlights and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and then I'll often do a, a final coat in some kind of pure red, which will be probably a lizard and crimson, something like that. Right. Now with, with the hair, I'm, I'm usually doing a little bit of dry brushing because it always looks, looks better, especially for highlights, that kind of stuff. But again, I'm, I'm pretty careful with, with this paper because it's so, so absorbent. And that, that just means that like, if I'm, if I'm careless with a stroke or I, if I don't think about where I'm going to end, then it's going to, it's going to record every, every motion that I did along with where I stopped. And that can look good. Like you can use that to your advantage, but if you, if you don't pay attention to it, it can kind of bite you in the butt, especially for larger areas. And that's the only drawback to this paper is that it's, it's so absorbent that it just, it's like a sponge and everything dries out very, very quickly. But it's thick paper. <laughs> it actually like it it fits through my printer but just barely and uh, I had a, a 
a scare on this one sometimes. Like you, you really, you actually have to physically push it through so that it goes, it's got to make it through that first initial, I don't know, jump. Because if it doesn't, then it will, it'll push it through. Like it'll grab it, but it won't be in the right position. And so the printer just treats it as a misfire and just pulls the paper all the way through. Like, you know, pushes it just through to the feed tray. Or not the feed tray, the receiving tray. Which wouldn't be a problem except that sometimes the, uh, however it moves the paper, it'll actually leave a, a little bit of a dent or a mark which is a, a scary proposition when you're dealing with a $3 piece of paper. Maybe it's two fifty. I can't, I can't remember. But uh, with the remarks lately, I've been upgrading them to this paper because I just, um, I'd rather paint in watercolor than in markers. Which is bad because I, I had just bought like $80 worth of marker refills. You know, because I, I do I do remarks enough now where it's like it, it pays to to have markers on hand, even though they're not really my preferred medium. Uh, and then I, not long after that, I, I bought this paper for like another $80. <laughs> and now I'm probably not going to use the markers very much. Oh, well. At least people buy these things. So it, it does, it pays for itself. All right. Uh, I haven't been paying attention to the chat. Let's see. Uh, no, I haven't tried the Daniel Smith gouaches. I'm honestly, I'm probably not just cause like the, the gouache that I have, like I bought some in, I don't know, the early 2010s because, uh, Holbein had a booth at like New York comic con and it was like 50% off. So I just loaded up. I still have not even opened up those ones. So I'm, you know, I'm sure they're nice, but. <laughs> it's it's scary to think about, but I probably have enough paint to last me for the rest of my life, um, at least at at current usage levels. Because I'm I just I don't paint that much, and when I do paint, I use very very little. Like I can't even tell you the last time I had to refill this watercolor palette. Uh, because I, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so what I did there was I, I preloaded the uh, the blue area so that I could have like an even coat when I start putting this on. And you can see where I'm working wet into wet, and I've got a little bit more time, slightly more time, to decide where this goes. And you can see it's kind of, it's turning into a gradient as I get less and less load on my brush. Uh, but I keep going just because I want to complete that gradient. And then I'll reload. Put on some more. And then maybe attack it from the other, the other side. It's funny, you, when I do it that way, you can really see the, the texture coming out, the, te the actual texture, the weave of the paper, which is not something I typically see when I, when I don't preload it or pre-wet it. You know, I'm not really doing much in the way of rendering. I'm, I'm Pretty much going for a, a flat, a flat.
flat color. Now you do see some buckling. Well, at least I see some buckling. I don't know if you guys can. But it's pretty muted. Which is good. You know, it's nothing that a little, uh, a little time under a book won't solve. I highly recommend the, uh, the book on Scorchy Smith and the Art of Noel Sickles. It's a great book, and it's super heavy. So that's, <laughs> whenever I have to flatten out a painting, I usually use it. It's big and it's heavy. All right, that's good. Let me load up a little bit more Payne's Gray for her shoulder. Ooh, that's too dark. You see? You see how, how dark that went? And then there's not much you can do once it's down, so I'll just probably darken that all the way afterwards. <laughs> you're, you're flatting? Nice. Oh, man. I don't flat that much anymore. I, I did start using a, an automated program for simple stuff. Um, the name escapes me at, at the moment uh, because I, I use it in conjunction with a Photoshop action. So I'm like two steps removed from the actual uh, software. Can't remember what it's called now. Right, and then we'll get a little bit of green. Some, where's my viridian? Some viridian, and then a little bit of uh, peacock blue. Which is just like a phthalo blue. Now for the uh, darker areas of her hair, I'm going to use some burnt umber and some alizarin crimson. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's good having a program to to do it. Just like there's still there's still a lot of flatting you have to do, but um, you know because the, the program doesn't understand like you know it can't it can't perceive, at least not yet. Um, I remember hearing that uh, Clip Studio had something that was a little bit better at like guessing where the the actual bounds were supposed to be, but it still, you know, it still wasn't perfect. So I, I just use it. It's especially helpful for me when I'm doing, um, I'm trying to remember when I, when I first started using it. Uh, but I really used it a lot while I was working on, uh, for Marvel Studios on the Spider-Man cartoon. And uh, I just had it. It wasn't just that I had a lot to do. It was that it was in a style that did very well for an automatic automatic flatter. Because uh, a lot like my regular style, there's a lot of loose ends where I don't quite close off the forms, which is fine. Like that's that's just my my style or or lack of it. I don't know. Um, but for this one, I was kind of going on, you know, trying to match 
the look of the show. And uh, it was a lot more, a lot more closed form. And so that for the computer, that takes out all the guesswork. So this is just um, the remnants of the burnt umber, lizard and crimson. That's pretty good. I realize now I should, I should probably put in some yellow too. I'll just use yellow ochre. Just to give a little hint of the, uh, the uniform. Now I'm washing out my brush, and I think I'll just wet this whole area. And then give it a nice light dusting of burnt sienna. Oh, well, thanks. Glad you like the uh, Instagram. Yeah, Instagram does really well in terms of engagement. Um, I don't know why it's so why I have so many more followers there. I sometimes do wonder if like if they're real followers, <laughs> but I worry. You know, I wonder about that for all of the social media stuff. That's that's why I liked I I liked Twitter, and I'm kind of sad to see it go the way it's gone. I just, um, I don't know. I felt like I was dealing with people. Like I, I never used the, the algorithm to discover things. And I, I know you can do that on, on Instagram, but it's just, it's another step. And it's a step that I don't want to take. Um, Cause I don't, I don't like it. I don't have any hard and fast rules about social media, but at the same time, like I'm not going to go out of my way to do like what they want me to. Like if it's useful for me, I'll, I'll definitely do it, but I'm, it's not something I'm gonna pay for. Uh, Cause I figure, you know, I'm, I'm helping put eyes on, on the app. But, uh, and you know, and then the other thing that I'm, I'm lamenting about Twitter is that, you know, I, I used to be able, well, one of my favorite things is I could put a link on Twitter and people could click it. That's amazing. And with, uh, with Instagram, they make that a lot, a lot more difficult. And now with Twitter, it's a lot more difficult. And you, you can't even... Um, if you're not signed into Twitter, then you can't use it. So before, you know, I could use a Twitter link and send it to somebody and they would still be able to use the link even if they weren't on Twitter, which was great. Uh, but now that's, that's no longer the case. Come on here to complain about Twitter.
I'm wondering if I, I just saw a phantom thread and I'm wondering if I, if that one actor's look is influencing my, my Jean Grey. I don't know her name though. Like, you know, in my mind, I'm, I'm always like, like I'll, I'll see some, an actor, I'll be like, oh, they'd make a good so-and-so. <laughs> and like, my own Marvel movies in my head. Hmm. This looks a lot darker on the screen than it does in real life. So I still might might lighten that part up because I it had absorbed the paint too quickly. So I gotta fix that. But other than that, I think that's about it. Um, I'll show you guys the uh, these before I go. Uh, so these are almost all finished. This is. Uh, Red Skull is cap. Uh, these will all be auctioned off in November part, as part of Comic Art Live. Uh, there is Skeletor. These are all four by six cards on the illustration board. And then there's Frank. Poor Frank. And then Mystique, who is uh, almost done, but I, I don't, uh, there's a couple things I gotta fix. She's, she's pretty much there. All right. Um, but thanks so much for, for watching, guys. Uh, I will, uh, you know, this will still be available on my YouTube channel. Uh, but I appreciate you guys subscribing and, uh, you know, because you get an alert whenever I, I decide to do this. So thanks for looking. Uh, here's a look at it, all of the... Um, all the materials and tools and again, but uh, that's basically it. All right. Uh, again, thanks guys. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and uh, I'll try and, you know, do this again in another week or two. All right. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.